Hello, George Romanich here. Welcome to Fundamentals of Weather and Climate playlist. In today's video, we are going to discuss in more details the daily energy budget at the Earth's surface. We will first discuss it a little bit theoretically, then we will use it to explain daily variation of temperature, and then we will also demonstrate it using measurements in uh, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. This is direct continuation of my previous videos, so I suggest you watch uh, Earth's energy budget if you are not familiar with the concepts that I am going to talk about today. So, if we look at the Earth's surface, like so, and let's split this figure just artificially so that the right side of the figure represents short wave radiation, namely radiation from the sun, and left side of the figure represents long wave radiation, namely terrestrial radiation. Then from my previous videos, we know that we have short wave flux of downward radiation from the sun, and we called it K down. And we have a reflection now of this radiation from the surface, and we call it K up. Now, not everything is reflected as we discussed. Something is absorbed and used to heat the surface. This K downward has two components. Again, I discussed it. It's direct radiation and diffuse radiation from the atmosphere. Now, we also said we can combine these two into the so-called K star and said that K star is K down minus K up. So you can see if K down is larger than K up, then we will have net surplus of short wave radiation. Now this is trivial because K up is direct consequence of K down, so K up can never generally be larger K than K down. But this gets more complicated when we look into uh, long wave radiation. Now, in terms of long wave radiation, we will start by examining radiation that goes up, and we call that L upward. This is a long wave radiation emitted by the surface of the Earth. And then we also have long wave radiation that the atmosphere emits towards the surface of the Earth. Some of it is absorbed by the Earth and then used to re-emit it back into the atmosphere and the outer space and we can call this L downward. Now I discussed all these in my previous videos. Now what we can say is that we can combine these two. L star is equal L downward minus L upward. And then consequently, we said that net radiative budget or net radiation is a combination of short wave and long wave radiation. So we can therefore say that it is K downward minus K upward plus long wave radiation L downward minus L upward. Or if you wish, we can say that Q star is K star plus L star. Now, it's very important to understand if this Q star, and that's net radiation at the surface, is positive. So we have positive radiative balance at the surface, then this excess of energy, very important what I will say, this, this excess of energy at the surface needs to be taken away from the surface and it is taken away through conduction and convection in the atmosphere, through evaporation of water from the surface, which we, which we called latent flux, and also conduction of heat into deeper layers of the surface. I will quantify that shortly. But at any rate, Q star positive means heating. Heating of what? Well, heating of surface, and as I just said a minute ago, heating of the surface results in heating of the atmosphere and deeper layers of the ground. Now, if Q star is negative, we have 
deficit of energy at the surface and we have cooling. Now, first of all, you might look at this and say, but how can Q star be negative? As you can see from this equation, what can cause Q star to be negative is either K upward be very large, but this, as I just said, K upward is directly related to K, K downward, so it cannot exceed K downward, which means this bad boy over here can result in total Q be negative. If L upward is large and L upward is this, in other words, if the surface is losing a lot of energy through long wave radiative flux, then Q star can be negative and surface is losing energy. If surface is losing radiative energy, how can it, where does it get energy? Well, there will be net transfer of energy from the atmosphere to the surface and from the deeper layers of the ground to the surface. So when we have cooling of the surface, that means that atmosphere will most likely also cool down because we will have transfer of energy from the atmosphere to the surface to replenish energy that is lost through this long wave flux of radiation. Now, uh, if you listen carefully what I just said, you can conclude that this condition, everything else being equal, is typical during day when we have sunlight and this condition everything being equal is typical during night. Now by everything being equal, what I really mean is that currently I am neglecting influence of clouds, which can change this as I will discuss shortly. So I'm assuming there is no clouds, the sky is clear. And I'm also assuming there is no wind because wind can move cold and warm air and result in what we call advection of heat. So there is no wind, we are just talking about radiative balance of energy. Now we can go further and quantify, I mean quantify, at least formalize the fluxes that I talked about that are transferring this uh, non-zero Q. So if Q is either positive or negative, thanks to this uh, radiative interplay between different components, then this surplus or deficit of energy at the surface is uh, accounted by, by the flux of uh, QH, flux of sensible heat, either to the surface or from the surface, plus QE, this is called flux of latent heat, and that's moisture either being condensed at the surface, which warms the surface, or being evaporated from the surface, which cools the surface. Or QG, and QG is the flux into deeper regions of the, surf of the ground. Just to put this in a, just to put this in a schematic way like this, so you can better visualize it. What we usually call in atmospheric sciences surface is some imaginary surface at the surface of the earth. We, we often just write SFC, that stands for surface. Now surface is imaginary infinitesimal layer that cannot store any heat. And the surface therefore is medium between atmosphere above the surface and what we call ground, which is below the surface. So if Q star is positive, and I just said Q star, let's say is positive, and surface cannot store any heat, then surface needs to transfer that heat through the, to the atmosphere through QH, which is conduction and convection, which I discussed in my previous videos, or through QE, which is flux of latent heat, or surface needs to deal with this surplus of energy by transferring it to the ground. 
and this is what we call here QG. Now, in the case when Q star is negative, namely surface is losing energy, and we said losing primarily through this guy over here, then, very important what I will say, then some of these fluxes, not necessarily all, but at least some of them, needs to be reversed. Because the loss of energy at the surface either needs to be replenished by the flux of uh, sensible heat from the atmosphere to the surface, or flux of moisture from the atmosphere to the surface, where moisture then condenses or freezes, releasing energy, or flux of heat from deeper layers of the ground towards the surface. Now, I would just like to say how this can be changed if we have clouds. Although this looks very nice, I have to erase part of it. Let's erase this and discuss how this differs if we have clouds. Now, here is the surface, and let us say here is, day, uh, yeah, let's say this is daytime conditions, this is nighttime conditions. Now, if we have, so this is the surface, if we have clouds during the day, then you will kindly notice that this k downward flux, k downward flux that is reaching the surface is reduced because clouds are very, very good at reflecting solar radiation. So clouds reflect solar radiation, so we have what we call shadow at the surface of the Earth. And therefore, the surface of the Earth is colder than what it would be if there was no clouds during the day, everything else being equal. But the situation reverses during the night. If we have a layer of clouds, so this is cloud. If we have a layer of cloud during night, it has no effect on solar radiation because there is no sun during the night. But clouds are extremely, extremely good emitters of long wave radiation towards the surface. So when we have cloudy sky during the night, everything else being equal, surface and the air above the surface is warmer compared to what it would be if there was no cloud. So you can see clouds are amazing. They completely differently affect temperature at the surface during daytime and during nighttime. And lastly, let me just say one sentence about wind. If we have wind, that is advecting warm air. If wind is moving warm air from somewhere here to this region, then of course we will have net increase of temperature. But if this same wind is removing hot air from this region to somewhere there, then we will have net cooling effect. And these are called uh, advection contributions but they are not associated with what, what I discussed here in terms of local energy budget. Now, when we understand this, let's look into uh, daily variation of temperature and how we can use these concepts already to explain why we have minimum temperature in the morning and maximum temperature in the afternoon and why nights, everything else being equal, are colder than days. We will look into this simple graph, or two graphs rather, where here is temperature during 24 hours and the x-axis is time. So we will start from midnight, somewhere here is 6 in the morning local time, then we have noon, then we have afternoon 1800, and then here we have 00, zero next day or 2400. Now during the day, again, no wind, no clouds, temperature will decrease during night and reach minimum just before sunrise and then temperature increases and reaches maximum around 
4 p.m. local time and then it decreases uh, and we can match it to the temperature of the previous day at midnight. So over here we have minimum temperature and over here at around uh, 1600 hours we have maximum temperature. How can radiative budget explain this trend of temperature? Well, let us examine it. Here is energy rate received or radiated from the surface and here we have same hour, 00, 0 06, noon, 1800, 2400. Now, we will look into first radiation that Earth absorbs from the Sun. Short wave radiation. During the night it is zero. It doesn't exist. There is no Sun during night. And then Sun rises, we assume at 6 a.m. and then we have energy rate or flux of solar radiation increases and then in the afternoon it decreases and we can assume that Sun sets at 1800. This is how the rate of energy received from the Sun looks like during the day. Maximum is around noon, solar noon. Now, how about energy that our planet radiates back into the space? I will plot it and then we discuss it. So if we start from some point here, then it generally it decreases during the night until the sun rises and then it increases but not as much as the absorption of short wave radiation and it increases like so and then it again decreases matching maybe the previous day. Why would blue curve look like this? Um, remember, blue curve is energy that the planet is radiating up and it is losing that energy. Well, you have to watch my previous videos in which I describe the great and powerful Stefan Boltzmann's law. Radiation from the surface of the Earth can be represented using Stefan Boltzmann's law, so uh, where this is sigma, Stefan Boltzmann's constant, 5.67 times 10 to negative 8 uh, watt per square meter per Kelvin to power 4, and uh, here we have temperature of the surface to power 4. So look, if we started from this point, as the temperature of the surface during the night is decreasing, temperature of the surface is decreasing, the amount of energy that the surface is radiating is also decreasing thanks to this law. Because if temperature is decreasing, L is decreasing. And this explains this negative trend of the blue curve. And then sun starts shining. And at that point, we have increase of the temperature of the surface because of the absorption of shortwave radiation. Well, consequently, the amount of energy that the surface radiates upward into the space also increases, but it, in magnitude, it's not as large as the amount of energy we receive from the sun. And then the history repeats next night because the sun settles. And at some point, notice this, in the afternoon, the Earth, this is very interesting, in the afternoon before sunset, Earth still gets some energy from the Sun, but in fact it radiates more into the space because as we will, as you know, solar angle is so low that we get very little radiation around sunset. So what we can conclude here that this part of the plot where blue curve is above red curve results in Q star being negative. Namely, we have deficit of radiative energy, deficit of, en uh, sorry, deficit of total energy at the, uh, 
at the surface, at the surface. And when the red curve is above blue curve, this is where we have Q star positive. And then through these processes that I discussed in the previous uh, slide, we can see that here we have heating of the atmosphere and we here we can have cooling of, of the atmosphere unless this Q star less than zero is not accompanied by latent heat transfer or transfer of heat from deeper layers of the ground. So what we can conclude then why is minimum temperature just before sunrise? Well, that's, before, that's because surface is cooling through the radiation of long wave radiation and there is no sun to heat it. So the air above the surface supplies its own energy to counterbalance this loss of energy by the surface. Then the sun and then consequently the temperature is the minimum just before start, uh, sun starts rising. When the st sun starts rising we have now the uh, we have now the uh, absorption of short wave radiation and we have heating of the surface. I am looking now, these curves should be, should intercept here at six, just around sunrise, as I just discussed. Uh, again, this is not perfect in terms of plotting, but as I often discuss in my videos, I could put here some beautiful graph, but I think this serves you better because you know the order of plotting. You know how you should understand these processes in order to be able to explain different phenomena. So if I mess some symmetry somewhere, please forgive me. And then consequently, we can also explain why we have maximum temperature in the afternoon. Because, yes, Q star is, la uh, sorry, um, the uh, short wave flux of solar radiation is largest around noon. But nevertheless, it is still larger than L upward in the afternoon until this time. So that means until this time, we have net accumulation of heat at the surface. In other words, if you want this way, the rate, the rate of heating is the largest at noon. But while the rate of heating decreases in the afternoon until approximately 4 p.m. It still exceeds loss of energy through long wave radiation and therefore surface of the earth is still heating up until this point when L star, uh, sorry, when L upward becomes larger and we have now net cooling of the surface which will result in decrease of temperature above the surface. You see how the radiative energy balance can be used to explain daily variation of temperature at any location. Now, let's look at precise measurements of these concepts and you will see these curves from an instrument and not me being the instrument here. Let's check it out. So let us look into the example of radiative energy flux measurements in Montreal, Quebec, Canada on 16 February 2008, namely winter, and 2nd July 2008, namely summertime in Montreal. So x-axis is uh, local time, and this dotted line be means uh, that radiative energy flux is zero. And we will first look in this equation that I derived in the previous slides into short wave flux down, short wave radiation flux up, long wave radiation downwards and long wave radiation upwards and then we will combine all of them to quantify Q star. So if we look what I discussed in previous slides, K downwards is zero during the night and then it's positive during the day. But already a revelation in summer, in terms of magnitude, this flux is much larger than in winter. Now, you didn't have to be Einstein to conclude this, but nevertheless, it's beautiful to see this from measurements. 
in winter time, because the solar angle is lower, we get up to about 600 watts per square meter of downward shortwave radiation flux. But in summer, it peaks around 900, much more. Now we said that part of this K downward will be reflected, K up. Let's see how much. This much. Now this is again something beautiful here because we can use knowledge from my previous videos to directly explain this. Let me ask you a question. Pause a, for a second after question and think about it. Why is upward short wave radiation flux larger in terms of its percentage to red curve in winter than in summer? Namely, why are these two curves closer in winter than they are in summer? Pause the video, use knowledge from my previous lectures and try to answer it. If you did it, congratulations. Now, as Agadmatur would say, for those of you that just want to know the answer, the reason is that in winter we have snow. And you will remember from my previous videos that snow has very high albedo. It can be up to 80%. So snow reflects a lot of incoming radiation. And therefore reflection is much smaller in summer when there is no white snow surface. Now, if these measurements were not in Montreal, but in some very rural environment, these curves would be even closer. Because in cities, snow melts more than in rural environments because cities are warmer than rural environments. In cities, we have removal of snow. And in cities, we have buildings that have vertical uh, walls that do not have snow, which all reduces albedo. But nevertheless, you can see how snow is efficient at reflecting solar radiation. And then we have downward radiation from the atmosphere. Notice that it is pretty constant during uh, night and day. However, during the day, it starts going slightly up because atmosphere is a little bit warmer than during night. Because again, atmosphere warms from the surface. How do we explain this hump and this hump over there? Measurements showed that at this time, and this time there were clouds in the atmosphere. And you remember from the first part of this lecture, clouds are very good emitters of long wave radiation. So look at this beauty. It's pretty constant poop, cloud. When we have cloud, we have much more uh, long wave radiation being emitted towards the surface from the clouds. And consequently, this would result in somewhat higher temperature at the surface than what we would have if there was no cloud over here. And finally, we have in purple this outgoing long wave flux of radiation. Notice it is exceeding black curve, which means everything else being equal. Earth radiates more energy into outer space than what it receives from the atmosphere. Now you will also see that this is increasing during the day for the same reason I discussed before, because surface is warmer during the day because of this big red curve flux, and therefore L upward increases in proportion to Stefan Boltzmann's law, to, in proportion to temperature to power, power 4. You will again see that this increase is larger in summer. Why? Because in summer, first of all, this flux is larger, and that means uh, more radiation is reaching the surface because solar angle is uh, larger, but also because uh, this uh, albedo is smaller in summer, which means a lot of radiation is absorbed, very little is reflected. And consequently, again, surface is warmer and warmer surface emits more than colder surface. And then when we combine all these curves using this expression, you can kindly see that the net radiative energy at the surface budget is in green. And you can see it that during the night, now careful, during the night it is negative. 
During the night, it is negative. During the day, it is positive. So during the night, this what I discussed now a million times, during the night when Q star is negative, this deficit of energy needs to be replenished either from the atmosphere through the fluxes of sensible heat or latent heat or from deeper layers in the ground. And we can see the same trend in summer, uh, sorry, in winter and summer. Now we can go further and go beyond radiative energy flux. So we can look into these fluxes that I just described. Now, kindly note that the green curve, that's Q star, is the same. These are same measurements. But now we want to, want to explain the green curve not in terms of radiation, but in terms of conduction and convection, latent heat, and transfer to deeper layers of the ground. So the green curve stays the same. We have to change here, not radiative energy flux, but just energy flux. And now we can look into these components. So first, sorry, first we can see QH, sensible uh, flux, is a negative during the night. Not much, but negative. I said million times now. That means that the atmosphere is losing energy and it is heating the surface. And during the day, the surface is heating the atmosphere. And you can see that during the night in summer, it's zero. So atmosphere is not losing that much energy, but here it is negative in the following night. So atmosphere is losing energy. Here atmosphere is being warmed from the surface. Then latent heat associated with evaporation and transfer of moisture either from the surface to the atmosphere or from the atmosphere to the surface. And you can see overall in, some, in a winter as well as summer, this flux is positive, but very close to zero. Why? How do we explain it? Well, in winter, everything is frozen. There is no liquid water or very little. I mean, in cities, everything is ice and snow. And it is very difficult to evaporate or uh, sublimate ice and snow. So the, this flux of latent heat is very, very small. But in uh, summer, during the day, it's large. It's large because there is a lot of green trees, bushes, water is liquid. And then we have evapotranspiration, evaporation from the surface and transpiration from plants, which results in Q, where QE being larger in magnitude, this dotted dashed line, sorry, compared to winter. Now, flux to deeper layers of the ground, you can see during the night, this is negative, which means deeper layers of the ground through conduction are transferring heat to the surface. And we can see that this flux is the biggest component of this deficit of uh, energy that we have at the surface. And then when the sun is rising, a lot of heat from the surface is being transferred to deeper regions. Look but then it is returned from deeper regions of the ground to the surface. And we can see somewhat similar here. So when one is analyzing budget of energy, it is sometimes often forgotten, but it shouldn't be, that there is transfer of energy from the soil at the top to deeper layers of the soil through conduction. And that's this black dashed line. And lastly, there is one more term that we want to introduce now that I didn't discuss in previous part of this lecture. And that term is QA. Now, what would be QA? That's called anthropogenic or artificial source of energy, which is very important in cities. Maybe, not maybe, it would be zero somewhere in the middle of the forest or in some small rural part. But in city, anthropogenic release of energy or heat associated with air conditioners in summer, associated with various heating devices in winter, associated with cars and public transport, and all other human-made uh, devices plays a role. 
Now, it doesn't play as big role as other, as you see, components, but nevertheless, it is not zero. It is hovering above zero. In terms of magnitude, notice it is larger in winter. But that makes sense, because we are cold in winter, so we use more energy to heat. Your, your uh, energy bill is higher in winter because of this, because winter is colder. But part of that energy is heating the atmosphere, as you can see. Now, in summer, that anthropogenic uh, source is much larger, but there is an interesting note. It bumps a little bit around sunrise as well as uh, around 20 hundred local time. That's because at this time people wake up and a lot of lights and heating devices and cars turn on. So there is a lot of release of heat at that time. And then at this time people come back from work. So they turn on TV, they turn on, they increase temperature of their rooms and so on. And again, if you go to your uh, local hydro electricity provider uh, agency and you check your bill, you will see that generally your consumption is the largest in the morning and in the late afternoon, namely when you come back from work. And this is also reflected in the measurements. Measurements by this radiometer in Montreal I don't know if I said it was situated at 25 meters above ground. Of course, we could combine now everything in one graph and get this figure. So we have radiative balances, we have fluxes that are not radiation, and we have these beautiful curves. This is why I don't present you everything at once. If somebody wants to explain all of this right now, it's impossible. That's why, first, it is very important to know concepts, to know generally how you would plot these lines. And then when you want to analyze this, you have to go line by line, because otherwise it gets messy.